Uh, and we're moving now to the last uh, speaker of, of this session, uh, my colleague Minako O'Hagan. Um, uh, is one of the most um, traveled persons in the world, having been born in Japan. She's got a foot in um, Ireland. Uh, she works at Dublin City University, and the other foot is in New Zealand, where she commutes now and again uh, to see part of the family. So she's always on, 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 on a plane here or there, and I was lucky enough to get her before going to other places to just come to London. Um, she's been working in this field, is probably one of the pioneers working in the field of localization. Uh, she worked, uh, she wrote a book, um, early 90s, when nobody else was even thinking about this area. And, and, and she was setting these stepping stones in, in what was going to come later. She has managed to keep abreast of things because the, the field changes really radically and, and fast. But she's always at the leading uh, front of, of, of this area. Uh, she is one of the organizers of the Languages and the Media Conference in Berlin, and, and she's always setting the trend of what is to come and who should be invited and, and what areas should be discussed and so on. Um, and she's also been working quite substantially in the area of fan subbing and crowdsourcing, and this is the topic that I wanted her to just uh, tell us and, and discuss with us. It will touch a little bit, I think she was nodding when she was talking, uh, when, when Kim was trying to define the difference between localization and transcreation, she was nodding as I could add something to that one as well. So I think probably during the talk, it will come as well um, as, as, as a little nuance to that difference between the two very new, trendy, ambiguous concepts that we don't really know how to grasp sometimes. Okay, so thank you so much for a wonderful introduction. So I'm going to talk about fun translation and translation crowdsourcing. And I'm going to stick to one particular area. Is there any legal expert in this room? <laughs> OK, well, good or bad? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about legality, ethics, and a bit of on creativity. So today I'm going to step back and going to locate these subjects in a kind of technologization of translation industry as a whole. And then talk about legal framework, which is totally mm -hmm. inadequate today and then creativity a little bit, and then solutions and emerging new ideas, how to tackle this kind of gray areas, which I think is very interesting. Then I want to leave with one food for thought with you at the end. So first of all, we live in multimedia age, as previous speakers uh, explained. Uh, although we couldn't make our video work very well, but we are living in a multimedia age, and. Translation profession is one of the professions which really had a huge impact of technologies, as you already are aware. And today I'm going to focus on new players in our industry, and that includes apps. So they are <laughs> referred to machine translation system and smartphone apps, which you can take a picture of a text and then automatically translated by Google Translate. This kind of things that people are already using a lot. And also new players include fans of particular media text and the so-called internet crowds, unspecified people who still think they can do translation and they do it. So those are the players that I'm going to focus on today. So referring to kind of academic text, Michael Cronin's new book, Translation in the Digital Age, he talks about um, this kind of affinity of translation in the digital era. You know, it's um, convertible, you know, translation is to convert one thing into another, like digital technology. And this kind of affinity, and things like Google Translate, you know, this very, very prominent use of technology made really translation very, very kind of talked about subject where people became very familiar with the concept, what they think they are, even if they don't know what they re what is really involved in it. So translation is becoming for everyone by anyone, for anyone by everyone, uh, like it or not. So that's something I'm going to focus on. And another interesting thing about this uh, trend of everybody doing translation is that translation quality is actually a uh, fit for purpose. So this argument that people don't always need best 
quality translation? It depends. Depends on the use. And in, in fact, this is Scopus theory that we talk about in translation theory. And this is very much a case of beauty is the, in the eye of the beholder. And I'm going to give this example from video game translation. This is not machine translation. This is human translated from Japanese game, Sega games Zero Wing. This is just such a well-known, uh, very poorly translated text that I'm even ashamed to kind of mention this again. But all your base are uh, belong to us. And it's meant to be something like we have seized all your base stations, you know, alien speaking. Um, but this is a kind of translation used to be produced by human uh, actor. They weren't professional translators. They were quite an, often video game programmers actually doing the translation. That's why. But, you know, gamers didn't really complain as long as game is good. So again, this is an example of really fit for purpose, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I cringe to say this because I worked as a professional translator myself. Uh, and I want to strive for high quality translation always. But the market is very much buying uh, this kind of idea. And the finally very interesting trend is translation as recreation. Now, some of my students are really into uh, crowdsourcing translation. They're actually voluntarily doing translation for different causes. And a number of them told me they can't wait to get home to do translation. That's their recreation. So this idea of translation not as a task or work, but as a recreation, even stress reliever is an incredible thing. But that's happening in some quarters uh, yeah, in a population. And this concept, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard, playboy. So as you can see, this is a made up word with play and labor. And this uh, word is coined by Schultz. And his book is a digital labor. It's quite an interesting book talks about kind of yin and yang of this digital economy. And uh, you know that is kind of exploitation, because we can never, for example, academics, we can never be free from students contacting us, for example. Uh, so work and play or you know, leisure barriers getting really increasingly blurred. But then there's a positive side of really empowerment as well. So it's an interesting. Uh, concept uh, being adapted to translation as well. So I want to just portray different approaches to transition in the digital age. Now this picture, I came upon this image when I was doing a, uh, research uh, in order to prepare for my talk in Italy. So I went to Google IT and did image search with a keyword traduttore. And this is one of the images it brought up. So obviously, you know, uh, for internet uh, sphere, this translator is very much bound up with computers, and often computers not working, and translators really uh, badly affected by it. And that was quite an uh, interesting image. By comparison, can anybody guess which company this might be? This is the people working. Google, exactly. Dublin has a European headquarters of Google. No, is that? Oh, I envy you. Is that? Oh, hey there. Okay. So this is Google, and they deliberately make work feel like play. And they have swings, they have video games, they have food everywhere that you can help yourself anytime, have ice cream. And, and um, so on the surface, it, it looks great, you know, it's like it's play. But at the same time, work is invading into your private space is a very interesting kind of concept. So I wanted to just use that as an, an analogy, interesting analogy. So finally, coming to my main topic today, fan translation. So there are many different types of fan translation. One of the most prominent ones is fan subs. So these are subtitles done by fans of a particular uh, media. It started with Japanese anime animation, but now spread to other types of uh, media and novel, uh, and nothing is kind of free from fan translation. And Dia Sinta Sen Sanchez, this very highly quoted paper says, fan subs uh, means translation for fans by fans. This is exactly it. These fans translate to share the enjoyment of a particular uh, media among fellow fans. Why do they do it? There are a number of reasons. Sometimes uh, 
because there are no official translations available. Particularly, there is so much anime production in Japan that, uh, and most of them are actually not translated at all. So fans become really frustrated not to be able to access or share the enjoyment with people who cannot speak Japanese. So that's one of the reasons. And another reason is huge delay in uh, for official translation to come up. So um, as you're probably aware, things like uh, Harry Potter, English-speaking kids uh, really enjoyed you know, straight after the release of the book. But what about kids who do not speak English? Then uh, fans decided to do Harry Potter translation as well, and they were released uh, much, much quicker than the official version. So people take this translation into their own hands and do it. And in the case, case of video games, it's quite interesting. Miguel mentioned this fan translation. Sometimes it's called translation hacking um, because they hack into the game system and uh, localize. And in that case, one of the things they sometimes do is they undo censored content. That's really interesting. So their pretext is that they want to get to the original as close as possible. Is that their desire? And sometimes uh, fans also complain about official so-called professional translation when they see the gap that apparently the translators did not have a genre uh, knowledge. For example, translators may not have been gamer or translators not familiar at all with anime, etc. So because fans by definition are really, really uh, familiar with the genre, they can really see this gap. And they don't, they are not happy with it, so therefore they do their own translation. And also, this whole activity existed since 1980s, but of course, this digital age very much boosted their activities by providing them tools for production and also collaborate together with fellow fans. So this is a typical disclaimer that fan translators put up. So this is a very popular Nintendo game, uh, Mother, uh, this particular version is Mother 3, and it's never been localized from Japanese. So again, fans decide to translate. But then they put this kind of disclaimer saying, this is a free and official translation made entirely by dedicated Mother Earthbound fans. Please support this series by purchasing official merchandise, including official translation if one is ever released. So this is kind of a fan's uh, ethics, you know, according to our own standards. And they quite often they put up this sort of a uh, disclaimer. But really, strictly speaking, most types of fan translation is illegal because they do not seek permission. They do not get permission to use the original copyrighted material. And that's a huge issue. Now, changing the gear. Um, now crowdsourcing. I don't know how many of you in the audience are familiar with this phenomenon. Is any, everybody familiar with uh, crowdsourcing? Most people nodding? Yeah, okay. But just to, uh, so that we're on the same ba page, this term crowdsourcing was coined by Jeff Howey. He is a Wired magazine journalist and he meant it by crowdsourcing the act of taking a job traditionally performed by employees and outsourcing it to an undefined generally large group of people in the form of an open call. So that's exactly what Wikipedia did. So this basically means participation in a self-selected activity. So participants decide which one they might like to participate. Totally voluntary and completely interest-driven. So if you, have, if you are contributing to Wikipedia, obviously you know about certain entry in a Wikipedia so that you feel that you you can contribute there. And some call this form a uh, new form of involving people into something as distributed problem solving. So for example, organizations may have an issue problem they cannot solve within the organization, decides to spray out the problem. Hey, we have this problem. Who can help solve this problem? And surprisingly, without offering monetary reward, there are many, many volunteers who are happy to impart with their uh, specialized knowledge. So that's the kind of basic idea behind crowdsourcing, and it's increasingly applied to translation. And high-profile examples include Facebook uh, translations that was done by Facebook users using this crowdsourcing. 
and uh, things like TED also does uh, crowdsourcing to uh, subtitle their clips of the uh, well-known speakers to inspire people. So coming back to fun translation, I just want to uh, gather up the kind of main characteristics. So this is based on uh, fan translator interviews. And they're highly motivated uh, groups. And they basically form uh, collaborative uh, translation teams. But they are totally unsolicited, meaning that the, the, the copy holder of the material has not asked them to do it in most of the cases. They decide to do it themselves. Hence, it's not legal. However, it's a purposeful activity. They want to generate a finished product. They want to add a translation uh, to the product. And uh, primarily to share enjoyment of the content, not to make a profit. There are some groups uh, who are known to do this, selling their you know, uh, fan translated material uh, on eBay. But they are despised among fan groups, because that's not the original ethos uh, behind this. And uh, as I mentioned before, this form of translation very much exploits their genre expertise. And by definition, they are not trained translators. Every now and again, uh, trained translators may participate it's in such a thing, uh, but very rare. So by definition, their translation is free from professional norms or any kind of norms. And they, you may think they do whatever they like. Not quite. They often fa have their own guidelines that uh, so fan translators need to follow such guidelines, which are different from professional norms. And they very much enjoy the peer feedback system. And this is where the learning uh, comes. So incredibly, they sort of you know, work within group. And they're really kind of a, a severe critics of each other's work. And that way, they learn. And a number of years ago, I did study on this. And I was just really very, very surprised at how efficiently, actually, these firms learn tricks of the trade. So now looking at translation crowdsourcing by comparison. So this is a mechanism to kind of reach out the right talent. So as I said, you know, within the company, they may not be able to find uh, somebody who knows the answer to the problem. So they spray out to the wi wider world through internet. And this concept of cognitive surplus uh, is quite an interesting one. Talked about Clay Shirky. He's a media uh, scholar. And so his idea is that in you know, olden days, people used to flop themselves in front of TV. We still do. Uh, but that was the main kind of uh, uh, you know, use of cognitive surplus. We are kind of filling our uh, extra time. But now we are more um, usefully uh, actively using our surplus time uh, by using internet and collaboration, such as uh, Wikipedia, for example, is a really interesting concept. And this idea very much exploits the wisdom of crowds. And so this is the idea um, um, explained really well by James Sarwaki's book. Um, and he explains um, when, you, when the crowd has uh, enough um, kind of um, diversity, and each one is a thinking individuals. And then when you take the average, their decision making, our prediction is often better than uh, any single individuals or even experts. So this is a very, very interesting idea. And it's very much applied. Uh, this is the kind of thinking behind crowdsourcing. And by comparison to fund translation, this is a fully legal operation because copyright holders of the original content call for participation, such as Facebook. So it is uh, typically a uh, legal activity. So let's just look at uh, these two phenomena uh, side by side. So legal issue I already mentioned, but ethical issue is quite interesting. So even though fund translation is not legal, when you look at uh, the activities as, as a kind of activism, because sometimes they do not, they, they are not happy with official translation. So this is a kind of um, uh, backlash against you know, uh, translation which is not uh, meeting their needs. So it's kind of a civil disobedience that some uh, scholars call. And they're doing it for unselfish reasons. So if you look at these reasons, you might be able to justify actually their behavior is ethical. And interestingly, when you look at translation crowdsourcing, on the contrary, 
because these profit-making organizations such as Facebook using free labor, is it really ethical? It's a really big question mark there. Now, when we look at creativity, so we talked about transcreation uh, a little bit, uh, but uh, these days, well, uh, fun transition in particular has become such a popular research topic among transition studies students. And they often talk about uh, fun subs in particular as creative subtitling. And I have a bit of issue with that because it's as if professional subtitling is not creative. That's not true at all. So at least you know one should define what one means by creative. So uh, by looking at literature, many people are actually calling it creative in the sense of abusive creativity. So this abusive creativity doesn't mean uh, in the normal sense of abusive. This actually links to the theory abusive translation. Abusive translation means that uh, the translator decides to um, foreignize the text. In other words, they want to bring the users to the source text rather than other way around to smoothing out for the users to understand. By comparison, transition crowdsourcing, it's a kind of crowd consensus-based creativity. So it's really interesting. So I hope among the audience, if you're studying translation, you might like to think any, any of these strands as your research topic. I guarantee it's going to be very interesting. So just to illustrate this really gray area uh, emerging because of this digital age, uh, I want to introduce this character. Does anybody know him? Kim Dokkon, very good. He is a German national originally. He changed his surname from Schermitt, Schermitt or something from to Dotcom. He's an entrepreneur, former hacker, set up a multi-million, multi-billion uh, business, uh, basically file sharing uh, storage uh, business, you know, cloud-based file storage business. Recently, he was charged by the U.S. government um, for copyright infringement because of his business. And this is what he said in response. I'm not a pirate, I'm an innovator. The qu big question is, this borderline between being creative, being innovative, is kind of touching into this illegal area according to the current legal system. I think it's very, very interesting. And it's it affecting translation as well. So this is a key thing I wanted to talk about. Sorry, I have one minute left, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So although we have problems, I also see some solutions coming up as well, particularly in software industry. I think their solution is very, very clever. So whenever we download a piece of software without reading, well, for me anyway, we click you know, the little box. And that is, you are saying you're waiving all your rights to be able to make any commercial gain from that particular software. And this is called EURA, End User Licensing Agreement, that curtails completely the rights of the user to make any kind of commercial gain. And this is a very good protection of the industry uh, from the users creating something uh, based on the original product, copyrighted product. And then that is applied to game industry is a very uh, interesting uh, thing. Miguel mentioned this users, you know, um, doing well fan translation, but also another uh, activities that users are encouraged to do in the game industry is modding. So modding means modifying original games. So game developers deliberately engage users, challenge them to really develop certain portion of the game, for example, to make a new game. And they even provide some si sometimes tools to do it. And this is totally legal because thanks to Eura, the commercial uh, you know, uh, gain is very limited. Basically, users cannot make any commercial gain. And at the same time, such activities can draw gamers' attention to the particular game. So very, very profitable approach. And it's very uh, clever way to get around this kind of user participation in this Web 2.0 era. And another one, interesting one, I um, discovered this, is I find it fascinating. So Norway's official TV network, NRK, they decided to actually put their own materials on this BitTorrent tracker and in a file sharing um, concept. So they put selected um, programs in there. So their argument is they can control and they can monitor what programs are more downloaded, more popular. And then they even encourage viewers to do fun subs 
uh, so program their you know TV uh, programs in English. So this is Norwegian and add English subtitles. And you can see those subtitles on uh, YouTube uh, and other places. And this is a very interesting approach to really embrace this age by saying what is legal, what is not legal, illegal. Instead, these public broadcasters are actually encouraging making material available for uh, fan subs. I think this is fascinating. So final food for thought. This is the current issue that I'm personally uh, grappling with. The proposition is this. Is researching fan translation legal if it involves accessing fan translated material which is illegal? This question came about because I discovered in Japan a number of universities had banned any fan translation research if it involves downloading or accessing illegal material. So interviewing fan translators is fine, but downloading fan translated material is illegal. So in other words, police can raid your apartment and seize that and seize you as well. So that's their reasoning behind. So I have one PhD student funded by Thai government and really needed to know this question before she gets into um, you know, her particular research question. So I'm currently uh, discuss in discussion with my university if it is legal to actually download these materials for educational research purposes. So I'd love to hear what you think about this uh, later on. Thank you.